Hello, this is Chuck Fithian. Uh, this begins part two of the, of the lecture on 17th century Kent County. In this segment, we're gonna look at three different topics. We're gonna to look at social history, architecture, and material culture. D Delaware is very fortunate to have a very robust database in the form of its colonial records. Like as we mentioned very briefly in the first segment, uh, Delaware lost a lot of its records during the American Revolution. Uh, but, but despite that, there's some very singular kinds of records that Delaware is very fortunate to have. It's kind, kind, frequently kinds of records that don't exist in, say, neighboring Maryland or, or Virginia. So today, in looking at social history, what, we're gonna take a particular, particularly significant one. And it's, it's this one that, that you see here. This is a record from 1687 of the freeholds and families that existed in a part of Kent County. V very interesting document. Again, one that really does not exist, a type that rather that does not exist in this form anywhere else. And what this record does is it looks at a part of Kent County. We're not sure it's, we're, we're pretty sure it's not the whole thing. Uh, the government of William Penn wanted constables to keep records of people that were occupying their, partic their particular area that they were responsible for, probably for tax purposes and, and but just to keep an accounting of, of, of who's on the landscape. So this is probably one of, one of those. There, there, may have, there may have been others. But nevertheless, it's a very important, re important record because what it does, it gives us a plantation by plantation listing and then it lists everybody on it and their relationship to each other, which is, which is really fascinating. So for example, this top one is Thomas Pemberton. His Elizabeth, his wife is there. His daughter is there. His son is listed. George Kendall and children, another family is residing, as well as George Kendall's wife. But what's also important, it lists their ages, the number of the household, the acre, and in some cases, the acre of the land. So from this, we can derive something about family structure, about household structure, that we can't get any, any other way. Now, fortunately, Delaware has some other sources that we can take and combine with this to give us an even more robust picture. Because remember, this is just a little tiny, uh, little tiny slice, but it's a very, but it's a very singular, but it's a very singular slice. So this gives us a look at what's going on, you know, among among these plantations, among the occupants of these plant of these plantations. Excuse me. So let's look at a couple different topics that allows us to to sort of explore. Uh, land ownership a little bit, but, but as it relates to social structure. Uh, the first thing that we looked at were the landowners themselves. You know, what's, how, much land are, how, how much land are they owning? And of the 106 households that, that were present, 93 were actually resident on the land itself. Non-resident were 13, you know, th you know were, were thir 13 owners. These, these were people who, were, who owned the land for speculative purposes, perhaps, but who were not, but who were not there, but they were listed as a landowner among among this group. So you kind of look at that. Okay, what's well, kind of kind of what you expect? There's nothing particularly particularly unusual about that. However, the land ownership pattern is interesting. That the people who are resident, who actually live on the land, own slightly less than half of the acreages that's listed in this document. The other half is listed by about 12 individuals who are non-resident. And the quarter of that is listed by one man alone, a very wealthy Quaker merchant in from Talbot County, uh, Talbot County, Maryland. So what this kind of indicates to us is that the Delaware frontier, and Delaware was very much a frontier in this period. It's sort of hard to think of today as, you know, we have C5 zipping over our heads in the age of, of uh, like, you know, internet and all that, that, that Delaware was the edge of the known, uh, some of the known uh, land. In many respects, it was a terra incognita, you know, you know, parts of it that people didn't know much about. But, but even as a frontier, it provided opportunity for some to own their own land, and it provided opportunity for others who had the economic means to engage perhaps in more speculative you know, ki kinds of, ac of activities. So we see both sitting side by side at this very early date uh, you know, on the Delaware frontier. So it's an interesting perspective it gave us on actually who's owning the land and how, you know, and what's the pattern of, 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 land, of land ownership. The other side, though, relates to the social dimensions of the frontier. You know, who were these families? Who were these households? How stable were they? How big were they? Um, what kinds of problems, you know, perhaps did they encounter? What was the range of individuals that 
listed, you know, that are listed among them, and perhaps why, are, perhaps why are they there? So here's a, just one. Uh, this is the Peter Gronendike household, and it's probably one of the most diverse, diverse that's in the group. And I wanted to pick this one for a reason, because it kind of come back to this idea of how culturally diverse Delaware and the Delaware Valley was. This is a great example from the perspective of a single household. Peter Grundyke was a Dutch trader. He'd been on the Delaware probably in the 1630s. Mary, his wife, is present. Johanny, his son. Patrick Grady, a free man. A Spanish Indian man. His wife, an English woman. One Negro man and his Negro wife. Really interesting patterns that, you know, that, that, you know, that we're seeing here. Uh, here's a free man in the house. Why, why is he there? You know, perhaps he, had just, he was an indentured servant who had just worked his time off and didn't have anywhere to go until he got his land, part of his, part of his freedom dues. Uh, perhaps opportunity wasn't there. Even though he was free, opportunity to gain land or to move somewhere where land was available may not have been there. So his fortunes dictated that he perhaps stay in this house and become an, an employee. He's obviously free, so he's not an indentured servant. Spanish Indian man. Uh, Spanish Indian is a euphemism for an Indian out of the Caribbean. And he had an English wife. So again, you know, this diversity, this, this social complexity. Of particular interest are, are the people of African descent who are married. Here's a family unit you know, that, that, lists, that resides in this family it, it, it itself. So not all of them look like this, um, but this will give you an idea of, what, of, of the diversity that's here, but also who, the fact that whoever kept this record made sure that everybody's social relationship was well known. So in other words, Patrick Grady, he's listed as a free man. That way, he's, you know, he's clearly not a part of the family. You know he's not an indentured, you know, indentured man or an indentured servant of any kind, uh, as well as these other distinctions you know, that you see here. And we'll come back to the, uh, to the, African, to the African family that, that, that was present. So what do we, what do we see? Uh, the mean size is relatively small. It's much smaller than the Chesapeake. Chesapeake's is kind of roughly double that, you know, kind of ru roughly double that. So about 3.8 persons is the, t the mean or the average uh, size of a, fa of a family. Both present parents are present in, in most cases. So sometimes they're co-joined families, but both parents will be there, which is at this point in Chesapeake colonization is a rarity. Uh, Children uh, growing up in the Chesapeake colonies of Maryland and Virginia most likely lost a parent or both of them you know, before, they reach, before they reach majority. Women are in every household. In the Chesapeake, the, the sex ratio is, uh, one, is, is uh, seven men to every one woman. It, that's the nature of a, of, of a colonial society. It's the nature of a very, you know, of tobacco culture that, you know, kind of, Postpone marriage, postpone you know, th you know things like that. Immigration into the region was largely an individual basis. So, in other words, a man would come in. He perhaps as an indentured servant. He'd work his time off, try to establish himself, and then con then contemplate marriage. This record indicates that most likely immigration into 17th century Kent County was not that way. There are some of the uh, households that are listed that are single men, but the overall majority, both. Both a man and a woman are, are there, at, you know, as, as, a, as a married couple, which is a very interesting distinction from what's happening in the Chesapeake, where mortalities, mortality rates are crushingly high. Uh, they're, they're, they're severe, and they would remain so until almost the beginning, beginning of the 18th century. Fathers are generally older than the mothers. Uh, not surprising. That chances are these men had arrived as indentured servants and had worked their time off, which served to delay uh, marriage and contemplation of those things. Generally speaking, families are quite stable, which again is a contrast to what's happening in the, in the Chesapeake. So uh, from the perspective of families, again, a different pattern. Most of these men probably had Chesapeake connections. They had probably worked their time off. They had probably gained what was referred to as their seasoning. In other words, they had arrived here. They probably got sick, got used to the, the disease vectors in the environment, survived it, and then became you know, and, and, and then became a, a, a husband and a husband and a father a, a little bit later. Um, but we're not sure of the immigrant origins for each of the families. Some we can link directly back to the Chesapeake. Some are, some are not sure where, where, they, where they came from 
or if it's the people we think they are, why they chose to move to Delaware to, uh, to, 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 to start with. So what about households? Again, it's a similar kind of pattern, very small. Mean size is about four people. It's usually about double, uh, sometimes a little bit bigger in the Chesapeake. Household heads are generally older, not surprising given what we've just talked about. Again, women are present, you know, women are present. And labor source, which we're, which we're getting, getting ready to talk about, is on the biological, biological family. In other words, the family itself or cooperative practices. And we know from other records that when it came time to bring crops in, frequently farmers would get, would get together and help one another. So somebody would come help you get your crop in, and then you would go and help get theirs, you know, get theirs in. Uh, there's a wonderful uh, agricultural diary from the 1720s by a man by the name of William Rodney, and he talks about doing that uh, throughout the course of the throughout the course of the agricultural agricultural season. So again, household patterns in Delaware are very different. They're much much more stable, although they're smaller, which has huge implications for harvesting all that tobacco and you know being able to be to successfully. Uh, operate within that type of you know that, that type of agricultural practice and and, and economy. So the, the role of women cannot be uh, underestimated here. They are a huge stabilizing influence on the Delaware frontier. Uh, obviously, uh, for natural increase, you know, biological increase, but also to have women in the household as a culturally stabilizing influence was 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 very important. And Delaware households, and they were present in Delaware households as, as we were seeing. So again, a very different trajectory, a very different pattern than what we were what we were seeing uh, for the, for the Chesapeake. Now, what about uh, as it relates to labor? You know, if if you have this very intense economy, you know, kind of looking at tobacco along with the, with grains and these other things, who's the labor supply? And this this record gives us an opportunity to look into that. And what this is is a series of households with combinations of other individuals in it. So in other words, you know, another family might be resident there, or a servant, an indentured servant, a free single, such as Patrick Grady we talked about. Servants with a free single there, servants, free singles, and perhaps African individuals, free single and Africans, uh, singles, a slave, and, and, and Africans, you know, Africans only, and, or, or, a, or a slave only. Those are the categories that, we, that, that as we broke that record down into, into pieces, those are the categories that, that we began to see. And what I want to bring your attention to is the top one. 65% had no labor at all. They had no one else in these households. So, how, so, so, the, so the responsibility of the agricultural success of that plantation rested on the biological family. Smaller portions had some combination of labor, either an indentured servant or perhaps a free individual living with them or, common, or, 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 common, or combinations. Uh, these, as you can see, these numbers get get, rel get relatively small. So it would suggest that Delaware planters either didn't, or for some reason chose not to 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 bring on an indentured servant. That was a, a fairly extensive responsibility that would extend to perhaps upwards of seven years or more, depending on depending on on the arrangement. Uh, for why they chose not to do that, I, I don't know. But with this kind of this kind of number. Obviously, it was, a, it, was, it was a conscious decision. Certain other households had that ability, but again, in relatively small, small numbers. Uh, only one individual was listed as a slave, and it was that Spanish, Indi Spanish Indian man. Now, whoever, again, whoever was keeping this record was very clear as to who was who within, within this household. There was a, a great deal of time spent on demarcating, you know, maintaining that, and making sure that making sure that was recorded. So if there was any other you know, possibility of, of slaves being present, this person would have, would have, would have, would have recorded that. Which, which brings us to the role of, Af of, of African Americans or people of, uh, of African descent in these households. The evidence based on this is that they were not enslaved. These were free blacks who are there as family units, which again is a very stark contrast to what's developing in the Chesapeake at, at the time, where, where slavery is becoming the main driver for agric agricultural production, and would unfortunately be that, you know, what you know, can, you know, from, from from that point on, from the perspective of this, slavery does not appear to be the basis of plantation labor. Was there slavery in Delaware at this early date? Yes, sadly, yes, yes, that was the, that was the case. 
Uh, however, it does not seem to, at least in, in Kent County, it does not seem to have formed the basis by which these people generated their agric agricultural production. From other records, we know there are numbers of free blacks. Uh, other planters are manumitting Africans who perhaps were enslaved. They're manumitting, man manumitting them when they, when they get here. Frequently, uh, uh, these people of color have huge responsibilities on these plantations. Some of them oversee some of its operations. Uh, one man we uh, read about was responsible for the education of the planter's children, which is, which is really an interesting role that uh, the, these people would have had. So from the vantage point of you know, 1680s, 80s Delaware, the African experience here was, seems to be having a different tenor, seems to be having a, a different dynamic. You know, there's, there's much agency, there's, there's freedom involved, there's, they're able to exercise you know, some, of their, you know, some, some autonomy. You know, the fact that they're, they're listed as family units with, you know, within this is, is really particularly, particularly interesting. They were not there as, as individuals. So we have a lot more of exploring to, in this to do, is to look at how, you know, what, you know, sort of the, you know, how the um, racial dimensions of, of, of all this played out. But again, to come back to the theme of the lecture, it does not seem to be following exactly along the trajectories of the Chesapeake col colonies at, at, at this point in time. Now, our architecture, what kind of houses, what, what kind of houses are, are, are they building? Um, this is an example of a house from, from Sussex County, but these types of sites have been found here in Kent County as, as well. And this is a, um, a very a, a type of architecture that's, re, that's referred to as post and ground or earth fast architecture. These are long ways away from, you know, from the wonderful brick survivals that we have from the 18th century that dot Delaware's, that dot Delaware's landscape. This is a very vernacular kind of architecture that comes out of English uh, architectural traditions. And basically to interpret this, uh, this is a post that formed the corner of the building. Here's the opposite corner. Here's another post that formed the wall. There's another one right in here, and here is its mate over this way, you know, kind of right, he's been smeared around due to the tractor marks. Here's where the fireplace sat. You can see the reddened earth or where the hearth, or, or where the hearth was. There was most likely a fire hood rather than a fireplace. And these are root cellar storage pits all around it for the storage of, of, of um, you know, um, various vegetables and, and things like that. To give you an idea of proportion, this dimension is, four, is 14 feet. That dimension is 18 feet. Uh, there are bathrooms here in Delaware that are bigger than that, you know, you know today. Uh, but remember, this family, this entire family is living in that kind of confined space. And this is a very common, for, you know, common form of architecture. We have found more and more and more of it as, you know, as we've excavated, as these, excavated as, at these sites. Sometimes the architecture itself has variation within it, but this sort of earth-fast structure, um, you know, uh, uh, post and ground vernacular architecture was, was the was sort of the common rule for for a long time. Uh, here's what that looks like. Uh, this is a this is the site plan for Thompson's Loss and Gain. That first post hole that I showed you the corner was this one here. This will give you an idea of what that looked like. It probably had a partition partition at some at, at some point. Here's the root cellars, and then here's a reconstructed house at St. Mary City. That will give you an idea of kind of what that looked like. Again, that's a long ways away from some of the brick houses that we think sort of typify the colonial period. Which, which really do not. You know, but if we were to kind of drive around the Delaware landscape in the 17th century, the early part of the 18th century, the mid-century at the time of the American Revolution even, we would see lots of architecture that, that looked like this. So this was a very, very, com very common, common style. What about their material culture? What are they, what are they bringing with them? How are they, you know, how are they living out their daily life? Uh, ceramics is one of the one of the uh, most permanent indicators that we have of material life. Uh, these ceramics represent uh, the uh, connections with uh, Germany, the, the Netherlands, France, and Great Britain. Uh, these are stonewares and, and, and earthenwares that represent a variety of ceramic forms that was used for preparing food, storing food, and, and consuming it. Uh, for example, this is a, a piece of a cup that's part of a cup. Uh, here's a storage bottle out of, out of stoneware. Here's a German, a, you know, a German stoneware drinking vessel, perhaps. Uh, here's a part of a Tingley's plate. Um, so this is the kind of ceramic range that um, Delaware planters would, would, have, would, would take advantage of and would use in their daily life. 
However, a lot of our ceramics look like this, and we don't have a clue as to what they are. They, they frequently form the significant portions of the range of ceramics that we excavate or recover you know, from, from these sites. And we can't tell you much about them. Uh, are some of them locally produced, uh, i.e. like perhaps regionally here in America, uh, likely? Uh, are some of these smaller uh, identified ceramic traditions from the UK that this, this ware is being made and then it's getting into the transit, transatlantic trade? That's a, very, that's a very distinct possibility. Uh, a number of years ago, we had an English archaeologist looked at that, and she felt it looked very close to ceramic types that's being made in Liverpool, you know, at, at this point. So um, this is an area of research that, that's something of a problem, you know, for us. Some of the ceramic types that you can see, we can recognize, other ones not, not quite so well. Other ceramics reflect very different economic patterns. And again, to come back to this idea of regional distinctiveness, this is a ceramic type called North Devon Scrofido. We could travel a short distance over into the Chesapeake, and it's everywhere. You know, every, just about every archaeological site produces a, this in some volume. But as we began to look in, in the collections, we're kind of going, where is it? And this is the volume of scraffito that, that we find here. Not a, not a single amount of it. Uh, there, there are several products that the North Devon potters made. Uh, they made the scraffito. They also made a, very, um, a much more heavier gravel tempered earthenware. We have very little of that. Only, you, you could probably take the number of sherds of North Devon uh, earthenware with the gravel in it and hold them in one hand, you know, from, from Delaware. And as you can see with Scrofido, there's, there's none. And at first we thought, well, maybe that's an artifact of collection. You know, that maybe the people that generated these collections back in the, you know, the early 80s, the 70s, and 60s that we're using, maybe they didn't recognize it. Maybe they didn't pick it up, you know, you know for, some, for some reason, and therefore it's skewing how we see it. Uh, our feeling, though, that's not the case, because as sites that have been excavated with, through modern, modern uh, method, these wares continue to be very minimally represented, if at, if at all. So we feel our, our pattern that we're seeing here is, is indeed correct. Uh, tobacco pipes, uh, smoking was pervasive. Uh, to, as we indicate, tobacco is very common. So a variety of styles uh, of tobacco pipe were in use. By and large, are the maker's marks that we can identify on these. And uh, remember that tobacco pipes were produced by a guild system. So the maker had to, had to put a maker's mark on it. You know, or f for the most part, they put maker's marks on it, identifying who, who it was as a, as a means of quality control, as a means of his membership in the guild. And of those that we know about, Almost all of them are Bristol, type, or Bristol uh, types. There may be just one, one or two from other parts of the UK, but all of the makers' marks that we're seeing are identified, have been identified as Bristol makers. Uh, we have a little bit of local, local production terracotta pipes that you see a fragment of. These are locally made pipes out of, out of a red clay. Um, we're seeing some of those, but again, we're not seeing a lot. Those that we do tend to be different and this is a, they seem to be showing up in later circumstances here when we, when we do see them. So again, here's a, here's a pattern in that material culture that sort of separates it, that, that's different from the, che, from the Chesapeake, uh, where they have virtually begun to disappear you know, by this time. So Delawareans are, are making them and using them a little bit longer and a little bit later, it would seem, based on the, based on the, on the archaeological evidence. Other, other artifacts, probably one of the most important artifacts that a household can have is the hoe, uh, hugely critical for tobacco agriculture or any, any sort of agriculture. And then other kinds of, of artifacts reflect various dimensions of domestic life, such as this table knife, here's a, here's a lice cone, um, and, and straight pins. Along with uh, ex ex the ceramics, we also have examples of exotic glass. So think about that for a second. You know, here's Delaware perched on the American frontier but yet very exotic glasswares, making it across the Atlantic and onto tables of Delaware, of Delaware planters. Um, these are, these are uh, types of darker glass where you have uh, a contrasting color glass actually pressed into or marvored into the surface. This very, fairly elaborate piece is a very highly decorated form of, of, a, of a drinking glass. It comes from this area kind of, kind of, kind of right in here. So here, you know, here they are, they're you know, earth fast house with a dirt floor. Uh, a few, maybe a few possessions, and sitting on the table is a, is a Venetian glass. It's really kind of, kind of a, a, an image that you know, presents a, a new, numerous contrasts. Other artifacts speak to 
you know, per, perhaps an African presence. Here's an exotic cowrie shell or tropical shell. Here's pieces of worked amber. Uh, the, the, the most northern range of this shell is Florida. So how, did, how did it get here uh, on, a, on a Delaware site? Amber is sometimes found in parts of the, of the American coast, but really not, not particularly common. So most likely this is a piece of worked amber that's picked up in the Baltic or something like that and then brought over, brought over as a part of, of uh, trade. So what, what all of these point to is that even though Delaware is on this very remote frontier, it is still connected to the wider Atlantic and even the world even beyond, you know, beyond that. You know, we tend to think of colonists coming over to the new world, setting their plantation up and living in abject isolation. You know, they pass, you know, they, you know, they, they spend their life in that state and, and then they die. Well, that's really not the case. That even though these, these planters are on the frontier, they're far from kind of where they grew up in their homeland, they're still connected to their culture through these real expansive trade networks. So, the, so Delaware had a, you know, the Delaware Bay, the Delaware River fit into a very important component of, of, the, Atlantic, of the Atlantic world and Atlantic trade. And that would be a feature of the estuary all through its history. You know, you, you moving into the 18th and even into the early 19th century, the economic vitality of, of the uh, Delaware estuary is, is remained. That began during, began during, during this period. So it's a re really interesting thing to contemplate is, you know, here are these planters are setting their plantations up, they're engaging, you know, you know, life on the frontier, but yet they've not left their home life entirely behind. They're still connected to their, to their parent culture. And, and that concludes the uh, second part of, of the lecture. Uh, the third part that uh, when we resume, we'll start to look at dietary practices and come back around to the subject of environmental influences on colonization.